we are in the book of Jude. And Jude is a small little letter. It is the second to last book of the Bible. And so if you get all the way to the back and you're in Revelation, you just want to go one book back. If you don't have a Bible with you, we have a couple options for you. There are chair Bibles and the chairs in front of you. And so you can pull out one of those chair Bibles. And I got to look at my notes to see what page that is on. What is it? 1,027? Is that what I'm hearing? All right. And so in your chair Bible is 1,027. Otherwise, you can go to viachurch.org slash guide. And on your cell phone or on your mobile device of any sort, you can pull up the notes there as well. We are going to be reading the entire book because it's only 25 verses four times this month. We're in our second week of this. And it's such a great little book. And so if you would stand with me for the reading of God's word... We're going to read this together. I'll read and you can follow along in your text. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people, who preferred the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued a natural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority and blaspheme the glorious ones. And when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walk in the way of Cain and abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error, and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feast as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all of the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers, following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garments stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. So God, as you bless the reading of your word, begin to cause it to work in our hearts and in our lives, that it would change the way that we live, that it would change the way that we think and the way that we see you. And so do your great work, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. 
Anybody else notice that while you were greeting people, their Hey Jude was playing in the background? You didn't even notice. We've done that to you two weeks already. We've been playing Beatles at your greet jam. And uh, so we've just had a little fun with that uh, because we think about Jude and it's so unfamiliar. We wanted to do something a little familiar. I looked up this week, like, what is Hey Jude about? You know, before we like uh, overdo that. And and by the way, if you don't know this, here's just a little trivia on the song Hey Jude by the Beatles. It was originally Hey Jules. And it was written by Paul McCartney for the five-year-old son of John Lennon. Um, when uh, John Lennon was divorcing, um, this five-year-old was very sad about his parents divorcing, and uh, Paul McCartney wrote this song, um, and, that, and, and it's basically comforting him, and also when the her in the song is really that he would let his stepmom Yoko into his heart and help things make it better. There you go. How many of you just learned something? Good. All right. That's not godly at all, but it's just good stuff to know. You know, there it is. Hey, Jude. Hey, Jules. All right. Um, so the main, con- the main content of Jude is warnings, and that's why we read this, and there's just these incredible, vivid pictures of, of, of dead trees, twice dead and uprooted, and we, we see these, these huge, like very um, almost alarming and shocking things, and it's really warning. So there's this appeal from Jude, who is a half-brother of Jesus, who became a leader among some of the early uh, Jewish Christian communities. He's an evangelist, and he writes to a church or a group of churches where there are teachers that have infested um, themselves and planted themselves into the body of believers. Um, They are partaking in communion. They are teachers. They've gained position in the church. And they're leading people astray with false doctrine. When it talks about the love feast, um, there's that in the very early church, there really wasn't even a distinction between uh, meals that they had, these love feasts that they had, this fellowship, and the Eucharist or the Lord's table. It was all sort of one large feast together. And he's saying, these false teachers are among you. They're sitting with you with boldness, sitting as the Lord's table is being shared. And these are teachers that are, are absolutely twisting what the gospel is. So the main content of Jude is warnings. And so um, I was thinking uh, this week about warning signs. I've seen some funny ones over the, over the years, and so we found some right here. And I've got a few of them. That, no crime from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, here's one, instructions, do not use while sleeping. I don't know who would, okay? Caution, this sign has sharp edges. Do not touch the edges of this sign. And then I think the bottom says, also, the bridge is out ahead. <laughs> Danger, do not hold the wrong end of a chainsaw. That's a good, that's a good warning sign. Touching wires cause, causes instant death. $200 fine. <laughs> Send it to my estate. No drowning. That's a, that's a, that's a good warning right there. Good rule. Um, the seller, no selling of drugs at this corner. <laughs> Do not pet the fluffy cows. It's <laughs> good. Slow children at play, hunting with shotgun only. It's <laughs> fantastic. And do not, please do not sit. Which, by the way, this is just a little warning for all of you. We're planting a few of those as the landscaping goes in. So this is, this is your warning. Be, be forewarned, Okay. So when we think about this warning, that's really what Jude is doing. He's warning an early church saying, I mean, anytime you ever hear woe in Scripture, there's a warning. Woe to you. Woe. He's trying to get them to stop and see something that they are blinded to. Have you ever been blinded to something and all of a sudden someone's talking with you And suddenly your eyes are open and you see something you never saw before. Like somehow you are missing it. 
and somebody calls something to your attention and said, hello, do you see what's happening? Do you see what's going on? And all of a sudden you go, I didn't, I didn't. That's what he's hoping. He's hoping that their eyes are opened to something that they are not seeing currently. Like uh, maybe they were just sort of lulled to sleep. Sometimes we can come to church and think, well, everybody at church means good to me. And one of the things I've learned about serving in a church for 30 years is like, no, like not everything at church is always good. Like, you know, things, it's just, just because you're here at church doesn't mean it's a 100% safe place. Just because someone's teaching it doesn't mean it's a 100% truth. And, and Judah's trying to help them to wake up. What are these teachers doing? These false teachers are explaining away the moral authority and the commands of the Old Testament as well as the moral authority and commands of Jesus. They're denying that there is any judgment for sin. There's now a grace and you can live how you want to live. They have gained favor. They're seen in the church as these influencers and yet they are advocating sexual immorality and they're attacking any moral implications of the gospel. And they're doing this through some things that we might not even understand, but they're attacking uh, 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 angels, they're, ta- they're attacking Old Testament thought, they're attacking uh, uh, teachings of Jesus, and they are taking this grace that is now this free gift from Jesus, and they are twisting it in ways and saying, telling people, it doesn't matter how you live, there's no judgment, and they're actually advocating sexual immorality. So he's issuing these warnings. And one of the things we have to understand when we're issuing these warnings is that sin will kill you. Sin will kill you. Romans 8, 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will what? Die. Yeah, this is, a, this is not just a, a physical death because everyone dies physically because of the curse, right? This is a spiritual death. Like if you warn somebody about something that can cause them death, we're usually pretty imperative. And he's saying, this will cause you to die spiritually. Like everything is at stake. The one thing about warnings is that God has always given warnings in the Bible. He's always given warnings. The Bible is full of warnings. And one of the things I want to sort of address today is how how should we read the Bible's warnings? And what role do warnings play in our salvation? God's always issued warnings. And as we look at scripture, it's really full of warnings, which these warnings often draw upon a motivational force from fear. Biblical warnings come in different ways. When I just sort of think about some of the different genres of literature, when we think of the genres of literature, you know, we have law, we have prophets, we have wisdom, we have letters, we have the gospels, right? These are all different types of literature in the Bible. When we think about the law, how does the law issue a warning? The law says, do not commit adultery. Like exclamation point. That's just the way the law comes off. Do not commit. It's like, it's like a warning sign, uh, not those, but like a good warning sign that just says, don't do this. When we think about the prophets, remember we went through Ezekiel. These, these people called by God to be very emphatic and urgent and sometimes descriptive, sometimes using like street theater to get a warning across. And usually they would basically say, you have sinned, repent. Like that's the way a prophet gives a warning. We probably all like more like wisdom literature, right? Like if you read Proverbs, it, the warnings come very different. It's like a father to a son. Like, like my son, don't go this way. Consider this. Consider the disaster that awaits if you continue to go down this path. That's the way wisdom literature gives us warnings. Jude is a pastoral 
exhortation letter. It's this letter that, that Jude writes down with urgency that would get delivered to a church or a group of churches. And there's this appealing, like I, I wanted to write to you about this, but I've heard that this is going on. So I have to write this to you. And I want to be strong in my letter. There's a seriousness about this warning. There's an urgency with this warning. We, we read this text a little bit. It makes us squirm at certain moments because it's like reading this highly passionate moment from, a, from an apostle that would have been writing to an early church going, there is a lot at stake right now. The thing about warnings is warnings inform us that we can drift so far that we are unable to come back. That's one thing that's really clear in warnings. Like, be careful. Watch out. Don't drift away. Hold on to your salvation. Build yourself up in the faith. There's this urgency because the warnings are telling us you can drift so far that you're unable to come back. It's a warning that God wants us to flourish and live in ways that bring life. Sometimes we read warnings and going, man, God just has these rules. I mean, he just wants to like, you know, constrict us and keep us. But when we think about God who created everything and for these things, he's created them for our pleasure. Like he has a plan when at creation, there was this order that was set up that there's an order that, that we as the creation humans created in his image are created to flourish. Do you have a plant maybe in your yard that flourishes? Like it just grows. I mean, it just wants to keep growing. It produces, it just grows. I, I, it just, it just like no matter what you do, like you pour gasoline on it, it'll probably still flower tomorrow. It just flourishes like wherever it goes. Then you have other plants where you go, I don't know what you need. I've paid money to sprinkle stuff on you and more water, less water, I put shade structures over you and you still like, Wah. How many of you know what I'm talking about, right? God's purposes in his commands and his law. We, sometimes we see the law of God as something constrictive or demeaning. God wants us to flourish. His laws. This is why the Old Testament writers say, I delight in your law, O Lord, for there is life in your law. When I live like you have called me to live, when I live like you intend for me to live, then like a plant I flourish and produce fruit. The law of God is not just a rules to try to somehow please him. He's saying, follow these things because this is the way I intended for you to live. A creational order that those that would be called God's people are always called to live into this creational order to be a distinctive people to show those that are far from God what it means to serve the one true God and live in the way we're intended to live. So he calls us to live in this contrast way that puts him on display and leads to human flourishing. Like when we think about the creational order of marriage, like even those that would totally deny God or totally deny scripture or Christianity or the Bible, like if they have a successful marriage, because there are people that are far from God that have successful marriages, like they've bumped into this creational truth and order going, if you want a good marriage, you have to be faithful, you have to serve, you have to give, you have to learn how to work through conflict. These are, these are things in the creational order that people can discover and find out that the creational order works. How many of you know it works because God made it to work? Right? And so when we are in Christ, we start to realize you're the king of everything. You're the Lord of everything. You're the creator of everything. We are your creation. And we are broken and we are twisted and we are warped and we see things askew all the time. And yet you call us and invite us into a way of living that you intend for us. And this is what causes human flourishing. Warnings in Scripture often exist alongside assurance passages. 
which stress the, the confidence or the hope or the security or the joy that we have in our faith. Like look at verse 24 of Jude. Like, like you are, or the beginning of it, very first couple of verses, you are called, you are loved, you are kept. Verse 24, here's this assurance after all these warnings. He is able to keep you. Like here's the warning, but God's able to keep you. Like there's these assurances that of God's power and strength in the midst of warnings. The Westminster Confession of Faith, written long ago, talks a little bit how we should look at this. It says, by this faith, a Christian believes to, to be true whatever is revealed in the word because of the authority of God himself speaking in it. They also respond differently to each particular passage, to what each particular passage contains. Look at this. I love this. Obeying the commands, trembling at the, what? Warnings and embracing the promises of God. Like this, this if, if, you want, if you want to flourish and grow in your faith, obey the commands of God. Tremble at the warnings and embrace the promises of God. It's a great posture. Sometimes we need severe warnings to remind us what is at stake. Sometimes um, in pastoral ministry and helping people and then knowing my own life, that there are times where God, God throws up stop signs in your life. Have you ever blown through a few of God's stop signs in your life? Just blown by them? The incredible thing about stop signs is probably, I think I read a, a, a quote one time that it's like, it's like 82% of the time you can blow through a stop sign and nothing will ever happen. I mean, that's true. That's just like the, the, the probability, the odds, depending upon where you are. But 82% of the time, you can blow through a stop sign, never even slow down, and nothing will happen. I mean, besides a ticket, but I'm talking about like an accident. And so in our lives, in our spiritual lives, right, there's times where we blow through stop signs. We just go, well, it says stop, but you know, 82% of the time, I'm fine. I'll take my chances. I'll blow through the stop signs. Like if, 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 if you're a teenager and, and, and your parents are throwing up stop signs over and over again, don't keep blowing the stop signs. If, if, if right now in your life, in your business or in your marriage or somehow in your private life, there's these stop signs coming up going, stop, stop, stop. And you go, hey, I've been doing pretty good. I keep blowing them. I'm okay. And so there's these warning signs that are sometimes just need to be severe in our lives. And I always pray, God, help me to really obey when stop signs, yield signs, danger ahead signs come into my life. We really need the promises, the commands, and the strong warnings of Scripture to keep us on a path of faithfulness. So often we individually look at this and go, well, geez, you know, it's just how many stop signs can I blow and God still loves me and I'm still saved and I'm still a Christian and if I die, I go to heaven. Honestly, like, sometimes our mind thinks that way. How many stop signs can I blow? God still loves me. The grace is still there. In some ways, these, these false teachers are going, oh, all those warning signs, all, they're, they're, they like explained them away. It's all okay. But really our question, and this is, this, I mean, there's a lot of people, some of you might be looking at it and going, you know, so can you lose your salvation? The, the whole question, like, are we secure forever in Jesus or can we lose our salvation? Like some of you are thinking about those kind of arguments. And I, and I would just say this, like the question is never how far can we get to the line and still go to heaven if we die? The question is, is how can we be faithful to God? How can we heed the warnings and claim to the promises and obey the commands so that we are living a life of faithfulness before God? I should hear an amen from a bunch of church people. I really would like one right now. So here's Jude, warning readers in a church 
against these false teachers, but what he's doing is he's exhorting them. He's exhorting them to live moral lives before God. The thing we don't like about warnings is that they always include fear. And I'll tell you, you know, tomorrow I'll start reading Jude again and pray about week three of Jude series. Tuesday I'll have books open all over my dining room table and I'll be reading experts and praying over it and thinking of you and us as a congregation and praying, God, what do you want to say to us through Jude for the third week? And we have one more week, so then what will that look like? And, and as, I, as, I, as I pray through that and I come to things like warnings and you get these kinds of things, and sometimes as I'm, even as I'm writing a sermon and praying through, I sometimes go, well, you know, they won't like it if it comes off like this or they won't like it if it's, if it's got some fear in it. Like, we don't want fear. Like, we get afraid of fear. We have, we're fearful of fear. Like, don't, don't try to strike fear into people. Like, how many of you have ever heard of hellfire and brimstone preaching, right? And in some ways, we, we hear that and we go, oh, let's just walk the opposite direction of that. But fear... The fear of God, in fact, even sometimes there's truth to this, that the fear of God has this awe and respect of God, but the fear of God also has just that, a fear of God, <laughs> like I'm afraid of God. That's, we, we don't like this because we only want to hear about a God that's just like warm and cuddly and we curl up and lean on his chest and hear his heartbeat, but I'll tell you, there should be a fear of God. Like my... <laughs> my <laughs> My dad, I had a fear of my dad. <laughs> I had an awe and respect, but I also had a, oh my goodness, I don't want to disobey him. But that didn't make me coward in front of him. That just made me want to obey him. And there's a healthiness about the fear of God. Not just awe and respect, but also that he holds everything in his hands and your breath and your life is a gift from him and it is at his will to do as he pleases. We don't like to hear about that. We like to just hear about this far off distant God who just loves us forever and he's just always warm and cuddly but there should be a fear of God in us. The coexistence of fear and joy and love can be difficult for us to understand. It's a healthy thing to fear God. The psalmist says this in Psalm 211. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. We like to think, oh, no, no, no. Like just, just push fear totally out of our lives. I'll just, I'm going to just say this. I, it's in my head right now. The reason why I'm sitting down today is last week I was pretty intense and it was pointed out to me, baby, I sounded angry last week. So I thought if I sat down, you wouldn't think I'm so angry this week. <laughs> that's, that's truth. You're like, why is he sitting? Is he not well? Do we need to pray for him? No. Nope. I just know I speak intensely. I just know that. I know that. I, I just learned that about myself. I have a very powerful, I've been told, a powerful personality. And so sometimes I go, well, ah! And somebody's told me, you know, you're just, your, your voice and the forcefulness, you did it. It was just like, Ugh! it sounded angry. I'm not angry. I'm not angry. So I'm trying to sit down. I'm not angry. But on the same side, I don't want you to lose the fear of God. Like, like Jude, I feel like I'm pleading with you. There's warning signs from God in your life. They come from scripture. They might come from godly people in your life. They might come from the law of God. And in our rugged individualism, we just run from fear. Whoa, we don't want religion with fear. I, I read this week uh, uh, Bertrand Russell, if you know him at all, late 1800s, early, to early um, uh, 19th century, um, British philosopher, like he wrote, like why I'm not a Christian. I mean, just this, 
just anti-Christianity, and he wrote these words, okay? He said, religion is based, I think, primarily and mainly upon fear. Fear is the parent of cruelty, and there is no wonder if cruelty and religion has gone hand in hand. It is because fear is at the basis of those two things. Unbelievers have often mocked and rejected the role of fear in Christian teaching and proclamation. I'm aware of that. Christians are often, we are often also afraid of fear. We want want to stress motivation from only positive emotions. I like to be a positive person. I'd rather, I'd rather exhort you from all positive things uh, like love and gratitude towards God. So, so God loves you so much and you love God so much and so you should, you should obey his commands to show your love. And there's truth in all of that. But, but I, it, it, it's much more comfortable to do it that way and much more uncomfortable with any use of fear appeals to motivate conversion or growth in holiness. But I would tell you, fear is a good tool in the tool belt of Scripture. And we could use some good fear of God in us at times. Our fear of fear comes at a cost. And the warning signs and passages throughout Scripture, if we are fearful of fear, can be ignored and also interpreted poorly if we simply fear fear. This week, um, I think about that fear, and here I wrote this, I think, on Tuesday. And Thursday, I was in a meeting and two friends that I have, that I've known for the last number of years, got to meet each other. And I'm always excited when my friends get to meet each other. We're in a larger group, and so one friend got to meet another friend. But one of my friends immediately said something that I know was offensive to my other friend. So I introduced two friends, and one insults my other friend. And she bristled a bit, and there was an awkward tension at the table, and we all moved on, and I just tried to put it out of my head, like, just leave it alone, just leave it alone, just leave it alone. And I was, in my head, I was mad at the one friend who offended my other friend that they just met, and suddenly I'm like, this is terrible. I usually love putting my friends together. It's one of my favorite things in life, is putting people I love together and seeing what God does. And all of a sudden, I have one friend that just offended a friend, and they just met at a lunch. So that evening, I went to the friend that I might have felt the offense. I thought, well, maybe this isn't really an offense. And I went to her and said, Did, were you offended? And she goes, it, it hurt deeply. I had to process it with a few people today. I said, I am so sorry you've gone through that. So that was Thursday night. Then Friday morning, I wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I'm trimming bushes throughout my whole yard. That's sort of my therapy, by the way. And I'm trimming all my bushes. I like to make Mickey Mouse ears, but I haven't had the guts to do that yet. But I'm trimming all my bushes, and I'm just going out there. And I don't know, when I work, I, I recite things in my head. Like, I am having conversations. And I was, I was in my head, I was speaking to this friend who had insulted my other friend. And I was like, blah, 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 blah. I was having these conversations over and over again. Then I was like, oh, and then I was in class on Thursday night for my master's, and, and we studied the wisdom literature, and like, how do we have godly wisdom? So I'm like, God, give me wisdom, you know, and, and I really was hoping that God would just sort of like release me and go, it's not your problem, but I... About two and a half hours into trimming bushes, I'm in the back, and I just knew what I had to do. I had to call my friend that had hurt my other friend and just blow the whistle and say, I love you, dude, but you hurt my friend. And I fought it. Bush after bush, I was fighting it. No. I mean, that person has great prominence in the valley. Oh, that person's been so good to me. He might get mad. He might just, I might lose both friends out of this. Like, this is, 
this is bad. And all of a sudden, I just literally went like this, dropped the trimmer, pulled up my phone. Before I could think anymore, I called him. And I said, I just, something's going through my mind yesterday at lunch. And I can't get it out of my mind. And you hurt my friend. And I, I just know, I know so much about your heart. And I want to just give you the benefit of the doubt. And he was so gracious. And within an hour, wrote a long email to her, apologizing. And I'm so glad that I just didn't stay afraid of fear and faced it because something beautiful happened on Friday and Saturday between them. Don't be afraid of fear. Don't let fear keep you from doing the right thing. Don't, don't be afraid of being bold for Jesus and don't be afraid to look the warnings of scripture square in the eyes and say, God, what are you trying to do in my life through these warnings and your command and your law? The Bible reveals a God who is sovereign and powerful. Here's, here's these teachers in, in, that, are, that Jude is writing about that is basically saying he won't judge you. There is no final judgment. Everyone is their own moral authority. But the Bible reveals a God who is the ultimate legitimate authority. Since he is creator, we belong to him and he has every right to command, to threaten. Does God have a right to threaten us? And he has the right to judge us. This is offensive and contrary to the ideas of ultimate human authority, which is the waters we swim in, guys, and the ultimate self-determination. I determine what's right and wrong for me. No one's going to judge me. No one's going to lay something on me. No one's going to look at me through some lens. I choose what's right and wrong for me. This is offensive, but my friend, the truth of the gospel is that we have a God who is sovereign and powerful and the ultimate legitimate authority who has the right to command, to threaten, and to judge us. And we should live in a, a fear, a reverence, an awe, and a love, and an obedience to such a God. We want to be in charge. We want to determine for ourselves what we should and shouldn't do. These teachers, these false teachers, were leading right into that. That, that human thing that I, we want to be in charge. We want to determine what we're going to do. But this does not square with the reality or human capacity. We will always fail when we are trying to play God. God's love for us in our brokenness and our sin is a major theme throughout the Bible. He loves us. We can't be afraid of human emotion just because of fear. When we, we understand this as parents, right? If, if, you're, if you've got a little two-year-old, little three-year-old, little four-year-old, and you're playing out in the front yard and the ball goes out to the street and they go running after it and a car is coming are you afraid of hurting the emotions of that child you could care less about their emotions right you'll deal with their emotions later you might shake them up you might scare them by the way you talk and what you do at that moment. But if you can get them from not dying, from being hit by that car, you will do almost anything. And scripture, I think Jude writing to this church, these churches, he wasn't too worried about whether or not they'd be shaken up and offended by his strong language. 
He just wanted them to stop listening to these teachers. These teachers are devoid of the Spirit, and they will lead you away from the only source of life. And when we hear warnings in Scripture, it's like a parent screaming at a child running into the street, Stop! Stop! Don't move! Don't keep going the way you're going. And I, I would say in our lives, we should welcome those moments from Scripture. And we should also welcome the people that God puts into our lives that yell at us, not worried whether or not a little fear is going to scare us or offend us, but that would speak the truth in love and get us to stop in our tracks. And today, I know by statistics that as we gather together, some of you are running into danger and today is God through his spirit and his word and I humbly pray that he's using me somehow to make an appeal to you stop danger don't stray from God he has a plan for you and a plan not to harm you a plan for to to flourish you a plan that will lead to life and 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 it may be painful to follow and it may be difficult but God has a plan that's better than you continuing to blow stop signs and I plead with you stop While we were still weak, while we were still unrighteous sinners, God demonstrated his love for us through Jesus' death on our behalf, Romans 5, 8. God's love for rebellious and broken humanity motivated him to send his son to rescue us. Jude 21 says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Waiting for mer the mercy of our Lord, verse 21, at, at the, the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. God intends his warnings and his threats to motivate us to repentance, to perseverance, and growth in holiness. And it's not just so we can somehow please him or check off some random list, list from God, but my friends, his commands and his ways are the way to shalom. It's the way to wholeness. It's the way to human flourishing. You will never find joy in God while willingly and habitually living in unconfessed sin. If you wonder why you're not happy today, if you continue or to go down your path and not confess sin and just say it doesn't really matter how I live, this is the very teaching that Jude is coming against. One thing I've learned in my own life is that I don't find the motivation to flee temptation and sin by assuring myself that sin isn't dangerous. or that my choices don't matter. That doesn't motivate me to avoid temptation and sin. Motivation in my life comes in part by recognizing the terrible danger that sin possesses, even for Christians. There is a way that seems right to man, but it leads to destruction. I don't even know where that verse is, but I just, it just came to me. There's a way that seems right to man. Broad and wide is the path that leads to destruction, and there are many that go that way. But straight and narrow is the path that leads to eternal life. And there are few that go that way. This fear that we have should not be debilitating or destructive. It should motivate us to cling closer to Christ in desperate and persevering faith and trust. 
such constant dependence upon a God who can keep us from stumbling, as Jude says, should produce unspeakable and glorious joy. There is joy and delight in following his commands. First Peter 1, 8 through 9, I close with this. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. My brother and sister in Christ at Via, may we heed God's warnings and delight in obeying his commands. For his ways are just and his ways lead to life. His motivation is love, but he is a God who possesses the power and authority to warn and command and even judge. May we live rightfully before him, not in our own good doing, but through the righteousness of Christ given to us through his finished work in Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for warnings in Scripture. Thank you, God, for the law that just says it with an exclamation point. Thank you for the prophets that point out sin and call us to repent. Thank you for wisdom that pleads with us and tells us what awaits when we continue to go down our own path. Thank you for pastoral exhortation letters like Jude that appeal to us And tell us the seriousness and urgency in which we need to flee such things. Thank you for your spirit promised to us by Jesus who would come to us and guide us into all truth. And we pray that we would be people of your spirit guided into truth by your spirit. May we not be afraid of fear. May we heed warnings and may we turn from ways that are destructive not only to us but to the testimony of our great God. Work your ways in us, we pray. As we partake of the body of the the bread that represents the body of Christ, as we partake of the cup that represents the blood of Christ, cause us today to remember that we have a God who loves us and paid for us to be in Christ and enjoy life as it's intended to be. May your kingdom come to our hearts and your will be done. Via, come. Come to the table. Let's worship the Lord.